Hello, in this video, I uh, will be doing a 16A revision. So just a quick revision. I picked some questions from the textbook. We'll go through those questions. And in the next video, we'll start 16B. So this is um, exercise 16A, question one. So let's have a read. The water is being poured steadily into these vessels. For each of the vessels, draw a graph of the height H of water in the vessel and the volume V that has been poured in. Label the horizontal axis V and the vertical axis H. So as still, same thing, we're labeling the horizontal axis as V, representing the volume that's already in the vessel, and the vertical axis H, representing the height, the height of the water. And I picked question B and D because I think they're quite interesting. If you look at the two vessels, the, the shapes are very similar. The only difference is that they are the um, they are the exact opposite. So vessel B is wider at the bottom, whereas vessel D is the exact opposite. So it's narrower at the bottom and it gradually becomes wider. So let's have a look at question B first. All right, so as we pour in water constantly um, into this vessel, the water level is going to increase faster as the vessel becomes narrower. So as more water is being poured in, Okay. It's going to take more time because the bottom of the vessel is wider. So that's why as the volume increases, the height will um, increase faster because it's getting narrower. So that's why if you observe this graph on the right hand side, V represents the volume and vertical axis H represents uh, the water level. The curve is increasing slowly at first but it's gradually becoming faster. So as more water is being poured in, the, uh, the height of the water is going to increase much faster because our vessel is getting narrower, okay? Whereas in question D, this is the exact opposite. The curve is going to increase much faster first, and then it's gonna slow down because our vessel is getting wider. So when pouring water at a constant speed into, into vessel D, the water level increases slowly as the vessel becomes wider. So for this type of question, you need to observe the shape of the vessel carefully first and then decide so if you're going to have um, a linear function, so a linear relationship or a curve. In this case, the shape is not, a, it's not a regular shape, it's not like a cylinder. Remember we said cylinder are uh, regular shapes. So as you pour water into a cylinder, you're going to have a linear relationship between the volume and the height of water. So it'll look like this. But in this case, um, vessel B and D, they're not regular shapes. So they're either wider at the bottom or um, wider on top. So we're considering um, a relationship that's not linear, therefore the shape of the graph looks like a curve. So this basically explains why sometimes we're dealing with uh, linear relationships and other times we're dealing with curves. So it really, it, it really depends on the, uh, the shape of your vessels. Okay, so that's question one from 16a. Moving on, the next question I picked was question three. So question three says the manager of the theater wishes to know what effect changing the price of admission will have on the profit she makes. So the answer is C, but we need to explain our choice. So why is this C? Well, if we look at the graph, okay, so on the horizontal axis, we have price, the price of um, the tickets, and on the vertical axis Y, we have profit. Okay, so what's the price you are setting versus how much money you're gonna make? And if we observe this graph, okay, price versus profit, this is a curve. So we don't want the price to be too low, but also, and you don't want the price to be too high because if the price is too high, then no one's gonna buy it. And only when the price is average, then most people can afford it. So that's when you will be generating the most profit. All right, so I guess we just explained our choice. Uh, but remember that generally higher price leads to greater profit, but this largely depends on the situation. Here we are dealing with, so it's a theater, we're selling probably movie tickets. So you don't want the price to be too low, nor do you want the price to be too high. So setting the price um, to an average price 
enables most people to afford it. That's why you will generate the most profit. So this is question three. Question six is also interesting. So an athlete is a competitor in a 10,000 meters race. Below are some graphs which could show the relationship between the speed of the runner and the distance covered. Question A, explain the meaning of each graph in words. Question B, which graph is the most realistic for a winning athlete? So I only picked option A, B and C because they are uh, they're very interesting to look at. So option A, before we start, if we just um, look at all three graphs, we observe that in this question, it's no longer time versus distance or time versus uh, speed. It's distance versus speed. Okay, so on the horizontal axis, we have distance covered. And on uh, the vertical axis, we have speed. So this is quite different from what we have seen previously. But that's okay, we can work it out. So question A, uh, if you look at this graph, it's a linear graph. So it's it's a linear relationship between uh, distance covered and speed. So as the y value increases, which is speed in this case, maybe I'll label the axis for you. So this is still x and y. As you can see, as y value, so which is the speed, um, as you're going faster, so you are, um, the speed is accelerating steadily. Okay, so it's a constant acceleration. But probably you don't want to do this in a race, in a 10,000 meter race. It's quite a long distance and you want to save energy. Okay, so if you're constantly accelerating, you'll get pretty tired after a while. So maybe A is not the most realistic uh, model. What about B and C? So B and C make sense because in a long distance race like this, 10,000 meters, you want to save your energy. So the constant speed helps to save energy. That's right. That's why for the majority of the race, we're going to be running at a constant speed. So we're not accelerating or decelerating. We're just going at a constant speed. However, so at the starting line or towards the end, all right, so at the starting line or uh, when you're sprinting to the finish line, you might need to adjust your speed just a little bit. Okay, so that's why um, the graph looks like this. So B and C are the most realistic models, the most realistic graph for a winning athlete because in, in B and C, um, as the graph describes, you can actually save energy by going at a constant speed for the majority of the race and only adjust your speed um, at the starting line or towards the end. So that's question six. Let's move on. So question nine, it says the graph relating the distance a car travels to the time taken is a straight line as shown. The graph shows that a car is, and you have a few options. So A, speeding up, B, slowing down, C, traveling uphill, D, traveling at a constant speed, and E, stationary. So clearly, this is a linear graph. It's a straight line, okay? And we know that when the, uh, so when the graph is a straight line, we say that an object is traveling at a constant speed. We know that for a linear graph, we can find the gradient. The gradient is if you have two ordered pairs, if you have two coordinates on this line, then um, if you, then the difference in y values over the difference in x values will give you the gradient. So uh, the steepness or the slope of this linear function. And in this case, rise is the distance. Whereas um, on the horizontal axis, the run, okay, so difference in x values, it's time. So rise over run in this question specifically becomes distance over time. We also know that distance over time is equal to speed. The function that defines this line is actually y is equal to x. So for each x value, you're going to have a corresponding y value that's equal to the x value. And since y denotes distance d in this question and x denotes time, which is t in this question. So y is equal to x can also be rewritten as d is equal to t. So we can say that this car is traveling at a constant speed. So this is the last question I picked from 16a. I think it's a really good question. Uh, for the graph shown on the right, for x is an element of um, negative 7 to 3, use interval notation to describe the set of values of x for which a, the rate of change of y with respect to x is negative. 
B, the rate of change of y with respect to x is positive. So in question A, we want to find when is the rate of change negative and B, we want to find positive. So remember the spidey on the plane? So for which part of the graph will the spidey uh, be climbing up the slope? Remember we said when spidey is climbing up the graph, then the rate of change is positive. So here, so between x is equal to negative 7 to negative 4, spidey is climbing up and also from 0 to 3. And when is spidey sliding down the graph? That's between negative 4 and 0. And now the question just comes down to how do we put this in set notation, in interval notation? Be very careful. We need to pay attention to the points, right? We have a few x values, negative 7, negative 4, 0, and 3. But which ones are end points and which ones are turning point? Because this is very important. It determines whether or not we need to use curly brackets or square brackets. As stated in the question, x is an element of negative 7 and 3. And in this case, since this defines the domain, so we used square brackets, and that means these two values, these two x values, are the endpoints. So the leftmost point on this graph is x is equal to negative 7, and the rightmost point on this graph is x is equal to 3. So essentially we're saying that when x is equal to negative 7 and when x is equal to 3, these are the two endpoints. So our graph stops here. And for turning point, as we can see from this graph, when x is equal to negative 4 and when x is equal to 0, our graph doesn't stop there. It continues. Okay, so these two points are not end points. They are the turning points. To answer question A, we know that between x is equal to negative 4 and x is equal to 0, the rate of change of y with respect to x is negative because spidey is it's, um, it's sliding down the graph. So we need to use um, so we need to use round brackets here, because negative four and zero, none of them are endpoints. They are turning points, and our graph still continues. What about question B? When the rate of change becomes positive, we're talking about these uh, blue lines here. So between negative seven and negative four, and between zero and three. For endpoints. When x is equal to negative 7 and when x is equal to positive 3, these two points are endpoints. The graph stops at these two points. So that's why we're using square brackets. And as we said, negative 4 and 0, they're not endpoints. They're only turning points. So we need to use round brackets around these two values. So we're using union to represent this set because so this portion of the graph and this portion of the graph. So during these times, the highlighted part, the rate of change of y with respect to x is positive. So that's when the spidey will be climbing up the graph. I hope you find this video helpful and hope to see you in the next video.